amazing. Thank you so much. Um, will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, just like the song says, I give myself to you at this very moment in time. That you would use me to speak your words of encouragement to those that are here today. And especially to the one that you have led here for some reason that I am unaware of. But Lord, this message is for them. And so Lord, I just ask that you would send your Holy Spirit. That you would send your mighty angels to guide the hearts and the minds of those that would hear this message today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, church family. I'm glad that you are here with us today at Scottsdale Thunderbird. I kind of had to be the pinch hitter today. Um, all of our other staff and Pastor Dave is uh, out. I guess we'll allow him to celebrate with his daughter who is graduating today. Um, I, I felt bad that he wasn't going to be able to do that. So I said, you know what, I'm going to Take, take the commitment and, and, and speak today. How many of you were here the last time I spoke? Just out of curiosity, you got a couple of people. Um, this is kind of a little bit of a continuation of that message. For those of you who weren't here, um, I really was just sharing my experience really over the last three years of getting to know God better through studying the word. And um, Bible study to me has been such an extreme blessing because as we learned in the last um, message if you listen you get to see and hear the heart of God and through Bible study we we kind of have to you know answer some questions I, I know that when we were raised you know when I was kids a lot of the times I had to listen to my parents and and just do what they told me because they said so right my kids understand that because they have to do things because I said so. Um, but when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to God, we have to want to know why he says these things, right? And the only way that we're going to be able to trust these things is to get into his word and get it for ourselves. And so what we kind of came to the conclusion is a, of our last message there is that the Bible really is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The long and short of it all the stories, all the things that, that you, you pick up when you read the Bible is that it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we talked about last time. Again, if you have ever studied the Bible with me or, or heard about the studies that I, I do with some people, this, would, this next message would actually be lesson number two. So we're just kind of going right along. And I think every time that I get asked to preach, it's just going to be the next study that um, I have in my in my thing and, and and really all the studies that we have and all the messages that I hope to 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 express to you guys is hopefully to answer the question why why do you believe what you believe why do you even come to church why are you sitting in these pews why is God important to you and I hope that some of those questions will be answered and I hope that other things will raise questions and maybe challenge your ideologies of why you believe what you believe. But in normal Scottsdale Thunderbird fashion, let's do a short kids quiz. Jaden, do you mind? I, there's probably only four kids that are going to answer. Got another one over here. Really easy quiz. Let's go to the first question. True or false, Jesus said that no one knows the exact day or hour of his return. True or false? Whoever picked. True. I'm sorry, it is D. I'm just kidding. You're right. It is true. Where do we get that from? Matthew 24, 36. But of the day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Next question. How can we prepare for Jesus' return? By ignoring the teachings of Jesus, by focusing only on ourselves, by reading books about Jesus, by loving and serving others. What do you think? Anybody? There's only four. There's a couple of kids, they can raise their hand. D. D. By loving and serving others, you are correct. It is about one another, which we're going to learn about today. 
And this is in 1 Peter. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Okay, and so we're, again, we're going to learn more about that today. Next question. What will happen when Jesus returns? He will bring everlasting peace and joy. He will bring sadness and destruction. He will bring a big party with balloons and a cake. He will bring a message of hope and forgiveness. What? What is, what is going to happen when Jesus returns? D. D, he's going to bring a message of hope and forgiveness. I think that could be it to a certain extent. Is there another, be- is there a, here's, here's for the, is there a better answer? <laughs> it's halfway right. He will, he will fulfill that message of hope and forgiveness. What's the other one? B. B? What have I taught you, son? Have I taught you that? Oh, man, I have failed. Let me, does anybody else want to preach? I am not doing my job as a father. What is Jesus going to do? There is going to be some of that destruction, I guess. A. A. I, that's what I'm hoping for, is that he's going to bring for the believer everlasting peace and joy. I am sorry. I, that was not rehearsed. I have failed as a father. <laughs> then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. We know this. That comes from Revelation. Um, There will be no more tears in their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow. For the first things have passed away. We will step into everlasting peace and joy. Okay, last last question. What should our attitude be as we wait for Jesus' return? Anxious and fearful? Indifferent and unconcerned? Hopeful and filled with anticipation, patient and steadfast in faith. Oh, there's like a better answer, a good answer. There's probably two. I, I would have to say there's two. Hell, there's, all our kids are kind of grouped together. Go ahead. What? D. Huh? D. D? Patient and steadfast in faith is correct. But there could be another one. What would the other one be? C, right? Hopeful and filled with anticipation. I just tagged it with this verse. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of our Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rain. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Thanks, Jaden. I appreciate it. So obviously, with all these questions, we're going to be talking about... Jesus coming, or more importantly, the end of the world. But I'm going to start with a story here. These two people are very special to me. Um, The one on my right here is my dad, um, and the one who's holding the nightstick is Jay's grandmother. (laughs) They are both very special to us. I lost my dad last year, June. Um, His name was Armin. And then Grandma Louisa, um, who Isaiah's middle name is actually named after, his middle name is Louis, and comes from Grandma Louisa. We have a um, law enforcement cousin and decided to put all his gear on Grandma for a picture. Um, he had, you can't see it in the picture, but she, he has his big boots on too, so it's, it was a really good picture. Why I bring these two pictures up is that... One thing that I learned from Grandma Louisa and my dad is that they would always say, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Get ready. Jesus is coming soon. Read your Bible. Pray. Jesus is coming soon. That was always their message. Even before my dad passed, when, he, when I started to take care of me and Jay started to take care of him about four years before he passed, he had it. He has died on me so many times throughout my life, heart attacks, and I had to Heimlich him and and do all these different things. After one of those events, we were at family worship, and I said, Dad, we have to have a serious conversation. Um, If your heart stops or something happens and and we're taking care of you, what do you want us to do? And he goes, do everything. I 
keep me alive. Do everything. I'm like, Dad. As a healthcare provider, I'm like, why? Why do this? He goes, I'm going to see Jesus come through the clouds. That's what, he's, that's what he said. He was in worship. I'm going to see Jesus come through the clouds. And so there was always these things. And I, I had a video that played at his funeral where we were in the Philippines um, maybe, maybe like 20 years ago. And even 20 years ago, he was saying, we have to be ready. Jesus is coming soon. And so obviously that's a, that's a question, right? Jesus is coming soon. We've been told that. But what does that mean? If Jesus is coming soon, for those of us that have been in the church, or maybe this is the first time that you've, you've kind of thought about this, what is that going to look like? How will it happen? What will the world look like when it happens? Is it going to happen in my time? Can the Bible tell me about it? And what's taking so long? I know I've had these questions, and maybe you've had these questions, but again, as we study this particular topic, we want to answer why. At least start hinting to the reasons, uh, that the to- I mean, the, the issues that are surrounding um, Jesus' second coming. And what's great is that we have the Bible. And fortunate for us, the disciples even had the same questions that we have today. How soon is soon? Well, in Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So there's three questions there. And they're very similar to the questions that we ask today about Jesus' second coming. When will they happen? What is the signs going to be? And when is the end? Because we want Jesus to come, right? And here's the response. You think that when you ask somebody a question, whatever they say next should be the most important thing for you to listen to. And Jesus says this in verse 4. Jesus answered them and said to them, See that no one misleads, or in the New King James Version, deceives you. So when it revolves around Jesus' second coming and the end of the age, Jesus says, make sure you are not deceived. So what does that mean? Deception is a very integral part of how Satan is going to get people unfocused and looking somewhere else thinking that they're looking at the, the right thing, but it's not. It's like this wolf in sheep's clothing. It's amazing what you can get now. In, in a, like, you just ask for a picture, and that's what they give you. And it, It's really cool now what AI and all this stuff can do now. <laughs> but it says deception is connected to the end of the world. He's saying deception is connected to it. And then he goes on to say, you'll be hearing wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Does this look like a front page headline today? Do we hear about these things? Do we see these things happening in the world? Hollywood makes a billion dollar business on that verse. I don't know, I'm not, don't raise your hand if you've seen or not seen these movies. I'm just saying that I heard that there are movies out there being made about the end of the world. <laughs> but Hollywood makes a killing on it. Armageddon, uh, Last Day of the World, Independence Day, you name it, the end of the world is big business. And for those that don't know Jesus, This could be very true for them. But what's even scarier is that within our own church and within Christianity, people believe that this has to happen and this will happen when Jesus comes. But we have to look deeper. We have to see what God is telling us because when we think of these things, are you happy about these events happening in the world? Are you joyful about these things happening in the world? 
Many things that we look at in today's society cross, create a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. I have, many of us have children. What is the world that they are going to grow up in just in the next couple years? It's very scary as a parent and some that is thinking about the end of the world. But what does the Bible say? How are we supposed to respond when we hear these things about the, the end times? It says, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. What does it say there? See that you are not troubled. Do not be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, so on and so forth. All these are the end. What does it say? Beginning of sorrows. Interesting. Because I can tell you, in 2020 and ever since then, people have thought the world was coming to an end. And there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of things that are going on because they use current events and the things that are happening around the world to guide their faith and to guide their feelings and emotions about the end of the world. But Jesus says it's just the beginning. Kind of it's a little tough one to swallow because is this the beginning? You said you're coming soon. It's just the beginning. But God wants us to focus somewhere else. He wants us to look behind the scenes and not just on the surface that there might be more that he wants to tell us. Sometimes we are unable to focus on certain things because I think this is the, can't see the forest through the trees or something like that, right? But sometimes how deception works is that the devil wants us to get to, wants us to look at other things instead of the things that God wants us to look at right? And so we have to get our attention back to what Jesus wants us to know. And he says, do not be deceived. All these are the beginning of sorrows. But the end of the world, we, it has to be, right? The end of the world should be here soon. But what does that mean? Let's go to the word of God to understand what the end of the world truly means. How will the world end? It says in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom we preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then what? And then the end will come. Interesting. It wasn't because of um, wars and rumors of wars. It wasn't against famines and pestilences. It says in this gospel of the kingdom we preach as a witness to all the world, then the end will come. So if this is what Jesus is telling us, what is... What is not happening if the end of the world is not here? You guys can speak up. This is this informal. What is not happening? Or what is, what is that implying about the gospel? It's not being preached as a witness to the world. Could be that. that can we make that assumption? If the end of the, Jesus says, if the end, the end of the world will come when this happens. So interesting, because I feel like we come here every week and we're doing that, right? So the end should come. We're doing this, God. We're doing it. So the end should come. But what is the end of the world? Let's define that. Matthew 24, 30, 31, it says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. What is the end of the world? What is the end of the world? Jesus coming back. It's not wars or rumors of wars or these, these pestilences and all these things that we're seeing. It's not going to be this great disaster. What the Bible is telling us, the end of the world is Jesus is coming back. What else, is, what else did it say? It said the elect will be gathered. So what's the natural question? Who's the elect? 
<laughs> Who are the elect? This is simple. This is, we're just studying the Bible today, guys. I'm not trying to preach a sermon. Let's have dialogue. We're just studying the Bible. Who are the elect? The elect, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you are once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The elect are those who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God has given the mercy to you to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's who he's coming to gather at his second coming, which is the end of the world. Are you, are you following me? Are you tracking me with me? So, again, the end of the world means that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for his elect. What else is going to happen at the end of the world? It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, for we, all, we will all not sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed." For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have, will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I love this verse because it's what my cousin spoke um, at my dad's funeral. And I remember this verse because... If we're still living here on earth, death is still an option. But when Jesus comes, death will no longer be a part of our lives. He will make all things new. And we started reading this earlier. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among him. And this is... This is what we want. This is the everlasting joy we talked about with the kids, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. Do you want something new? Isn't it great to get something new? At Jesus' second coming, we will be made new. We will be immortal. Death will never be a part of, of our lives anymore. We'll be free from the bondage of sin. So is the end of the world a good thing or a bad thing? If we are believers in Christ, we should be longing for the end of the world. Because we should be longing for Jesus to come back. We should not be focused on the things that are surrounding before he comes. That's not for us if we are believers and followers of God. Can we all agree on that? So what is this all saying? We asked it before, why isn't Jesus coming? Why is it one of the reasons why he hasn't come yet? Because why? We read it earlier. The gospel is what? For whatever reason, there's somebody else that needs to hear the good news about Jesus. So this is telling us that here today, if you want the end of the world to come, what must we do as a congregation, as a community? We need to tell others the good news about Jesus, right? The gospel needs to go out and be preached into all the world. But what do we need to share? 
This is, this is where we kind of will dig a little bit deeper. Because we say, oh yeah, let's share the good news, gospel, let's pray, end of story, church is done. But you have to look, when you study the Bible, you kind of have to look in context. What are the things it's saying? It says, and the gospel of the kingdom. What does it say there? This. What's the difference between the and this? It's very specific. There is a specific gospel of the kingdom that needs to be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. Well, what gospel is that? What gospel? I see, I prompted myself. What gospel is this gospel? As a part, a member, as a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, this picture should be very familiar. It should speak a lot to you about what this represents as our church. What is it? If just by looking at it, what would you say this picture is about? If you're studying your Sabbath school, you should you should know this. Three cosmic messages, three angels' message, right? And is this the gospel that Jesus was talking about? Let's read it. This gospel. And I saw another angel flying in, the mid, in mid-heaven, having the eternal gospel, to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he says with a soft voice, loud voice, right? Going to every, this is going to all the world, right? Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. And another angel, a second one, that was today's lesson in Sabbath school. We'll have to study that one. I didn't get to teach it today, but this was today's um, topic. A second one followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon. She who has made all nations drink the wine of the passions of her immorality. Is this the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching? Let's, read, let's keep reading. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger and his torment. So, Isaiah, you were right. There's, there's sadness and destruction. There's a cup of anger here. So I did okay. <laughs> And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, air and night, those who worship the beast, his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Is this really the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching to all the world and then the end will come? Huh, interesting. Well, we know it is, and we're not going to go into this because I know it's almost time to close I'm putting this out there because I want you to study and dig deeper. But if you look at Revelation 14, 14 to 16, it shows that the harvest and the elect are gathered after these messages. Same in Matthew 13, it talks about the wheat and tares where the harvest, where where Jesus will gather the harvest. And we see that the second coming is right before these messages. And again, we won't go into all the details with that, but again... What I'm trying to drive home here is that if this is the gospel that needs to go into all the world, do you know enough about the gospels to be able to preach as a witness to all the world? Here's some questions that I just put up there. I'm not, we're not going to answer these, but again, if I'm looking at the first angel's message, what does it mean to fear God and give glory to him? How do we worship him to acknowledge him as creator? When did this judgment begin? Why is there a need for judgment? Who's being judged? How are they being judged? Do you know the answers to these questions? Second angel, who's Babylon? Why are we bringing up Babylon? Is Babylon a person, a place? Why is it fallen? Why are we talking about drinking wine and getting drunk? Why are we talking about these things? Third angel, probably the most strangest thing. If we're we're talking about the gospel or the good news, who is this beast? What is this image? Why will the world worship it? What is this mark of the beast? Is it a chip? Is it the vaccine? Is it something else? Like all of these things that are connected to the gospel, this good news to bring about the end of the world seem very strange, to be honest. It seems very strange coming into this, looking at this, and I'm telling you right now that this is the gospel that needs to go out 
before the end of the world comes. And I want you to talk about a beast. It's kind of weird. But we have to continue to dig deep. If you want that end of the world to come, we have to go to the source. And we have to go into our Bibles to understand what this means. And we talked about this in in the last message I preached But when we study these three angels, we have to know what our true north is. We have to understand why we are delivering these messages. And where we find that is in the very first verse of the same book in Revelation 1.1. It's that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who reads, who hears these words of prophecy... And heed the things that are written in it because the time is near. So when you look at the three angels and all those things that are comprised about it, it has to reveal to you more about Jesus Christ. But haven't we been preaching this? We are the church of the three angels. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached, period. There's no period there, right? It says, in all the world as what? As a witness. That other word for that is testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. I'm glad that there's no period thereafter preached. Because if there was, then Jesus would have been here a long time ago because we've been doing a lot of preaching. I'm doing preaching right now, right? But it says in all the world as a witness. We've been, we are the church of going to all the world. And I'm not here to knock any of these things. These are all great resources. But the Adventist church has so many resources to go to all the world. They are preaching it day and night, 24-7, all around the clock. But yet the end of the world is still not here. What does it mean to preach as a witness? And this is where we're going to kind of rest our thoughts before we close. Doing this... It's good. I'm happy to serve God in this capacity and actually preach because this is not what I like to do. This is not my normal thing. I, I, I mean, I, like, I can speak in front of people, but to be very honest with you, I, I, I feel very underqualified to be doing this. Speaking about real topics, about real things to real people going through real issues in life. And I'm trying to deliver a message of hope. You may not know that behind the scenes, I'm running out of hope. That I go home and I'm depressed or doing other things. Preaching is is a way of creating a facade. And I can make that look all good. I can keep all the balls juggled up in the air and do all those things. But this is the reason why we are called to preach as a witness. This is a great place to practice and do those things but in order to gather the elect and gather the harvest it has to be done outside of these walls in our everyday lives with everyday people that we interact with are you a witness to your co-workers are you a witness to your children what do they see do they see the gospel in you outside of these walls As a witness, Revelation 14 says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The ones that are going to end up getting to the end of that world experience are doing these things. And as a church, we can probably check off the boxes. Do we keep the commandments? Yeah, we keep the commandments, even the Sabbath, and do all these different things. And we have faith in Jesus. We love Jesus, right? But again, what does that look like? It says, the greatest commandment in Matthew 24, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great 
and foremost commandment. But what does that say, that next line say? The second is like it, right? So it's just like the first, which means you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Outside these walls, if we want Jesus to come and the end of the world to come, to be honest, we don't need more knowledge of what is going to happen and more knowledge about prophecy and all these things. And again, I'm not putting those things down. As a church and as a church community, we got to learn how to love God better and love people better. This is the gospel that needs to be preached as a witness. In that first angel's message, this is what it's about. Love God, love people, love my creation. When that happens as a witness, Jesus will come. And I challenge each one of you today who are hearing this message Don't just preach. Preach it as a witness of Jesus Christ. Be a revelation, a true revelation of Jesus Christ to someone each and every day. And I truly believe in my heart that all of us in this room are part of the generation that that will experience what my dad wanted and we will see Jesus come through the clouds. What a day that's going to be. It's going to be east, east, right? We're going to look, and Jesus is going to come through the clouds. I can't wait for that day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this message. And and while there are so much uh, intricacies and details that can be pulled out from each one of those verses, Lord, the message is simple. Teach us how to love you better and love others better. To preach your good news as a witness for you so that we may reveal the true image of Jesus to the world. Because, Lord, we want to see you come. We want the end of the world to come because we want to be gathered to you. We want to be in that kingdom where there is no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. Lord Jesus, please have mercy on us for our doubt and our lack of faith at times. But Lord, today, I just ask that your spirit bless each and every one of us who are hearing this message today, that from here on out, we will be committed and motivated to be a witness to the world so that we can see you come. All these things I ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.